if you have a 10% error, which means epsilon is like 0.1, right? So instead of that second B element, instead of being 1, it's 1.1. Um, then the solution becomes that. <laughs> that sucks. All right. That's nowhere close to the real solution. Nowhere close. Okay? All right. So, needless to say, a small error in the data induced a huge change in the solution. And this, is a, this is a problem, right? And so, we would like to know when this is a problem before we do this, right? Because, again, if this is something you didn't, weren't paying attention to, maybe you would use this solution and that would not be a good idea. So we want some way of characterizing when do we think a problem is going to have this issue, right? When do we think um, the problem is going to be ill-conditioned? And to do that, we're going to introduce this thing called the condition number, okay? And it's going to be defined in terms of the, the matrix norms. So this is the definition. So kappa means, just the notation she used there, means the condition number of the matrix A. It's computed like shown there. You take the norm of the matrix A and you multiply it times the norm of the inverse of the matrix A. Okay. So in principle, to compute this by hand, you need to know the matrix A and its inverse. Okay. So, the, and the thing, the thing about the condition numbers, there's no universal agreement on what large means and what lar when large becomes a problem. But I, can, I think when you can generally say if the condition number becomes greater than 1,000, you're getting concerned. Okay? You're getting concerned your problem's becoming ill-conditioned. I can tell you that, um, you know, you c a, a, a condition number 1,000 itself probably is not too bad, but if it starts getting above 1,000, then you, you start paying attention. Okay? So here's just a little toy example um, that I guess, I guess we did this at some point. I don't know. I apparently didn't do it in MATLAB, but there's, there's a matrix A, okay? And there, that ends up being the inverse of this matrix A. How did I find that? I guess I found that by Gauss-Jordan elimination. It's the only way we know to find the inverse, or in MATLAB, your choice, okay? So, okay, so now we have the matrix A, and we also have the inverse of the matrix A on hand. So we can compute the um, condition number of the matrix A. Now you notice this involves the norm of the matrix A and its inverse. So strictly speaking, you should say which norm you're computing this condition number with respect to. Because you'll get a different answer if you use the one norm of this matrix or the Frobenius norm or the infinity norm. So I'm telling you right now I'm going to use the one norm. Okay, that means the column sum norm. Okay. So first of all, I, I need to find the, the um, norm, the one norm of the matrix A. What I'm going to do is take each column, right, because that means column sum. I'm going to go over each column, add up every column, the absolute values. They're all seven, okay? It's just serendipity, I guess. And so that's where I get the number seven from, okay? Now, here's the inverse. You recall that if, if I want to take the norm of this thing, I can pull the one over 56 out. It's the property of a norm. Right? Sorry to do this to you. I know people hate this, but I just do it anyway. Because I'm a tenured full professor. All right? So I'm using this property right here. If you have a constant times A and you want to take the norm, you can just take the K out, take its absolute value, and then take the norm of A. So that's what I've done here. Okay? And now I want to do the column sum norm of, the ma of what's left here. So add up each column. What this one is 16. This one is 30. This one is also 30 because I'm using absolute values. So the, the norm of that thing is 30. You multiply those three th things together, you get, out three, you get exactly 3.75. Okay. That's a really well-conditioned matrix. The, the lowest this number can be is 1. Okay. The highest it can be is infinity. So 3.75 is an extremely well-conditioned matrix. You would never anticipate having any problem with this particular example. Okay. All right. Um, so wh what I probably should have mentioned is when we got back to this example here, the, the reason, okay, the reason this kind of ill conditioning and these small numbers are hurtful to you is if, if you had a computer with infinite precision, like it had infinite number of significant digits, then none of this would be an issue. But even if the, every number is represented by 16 digits, if you do a million calculations and there's little errors that are induced each calculation because of really small numbers like this, um, this will end up screwing up um, anal uh, computer calculations as well, even if there's no data error, okay? All right, so here's an example. Um, so I guess this is, 
This is an example I just made up. I haven't seen this example in previous notes. So here's the matrix A we want to work with. I formulate it because it looks ill-conditioned, <laughs> right? It looks, it looks naughty. Um, certainly the first row look, multiplied by one looks almost like the second row. So I anticipate it's going to have a big condition number. So it's trivial to find the inverse of a two by two matrix. You might recall you multiply those two elements and then to first it's one over the determinant, right? This is the determinant. I got that by multiplying those two and subtracting those two. That's why you get that small number. You can imagine that small number there is the problem, okay? Then I switch these two diagonal elements, negate the two off diagonal elements and get this for the inverse, okay? And now I want to find the condition number, so I take the one norm of A, it's the same thing for both columns, this number, and then I'm going to take the one norm of the inverse, again I pull the constant out right there, both, both um, columns give me the same thing, which is that number, multiply these things together, 20,000. Okay, that's, that's a bad matrix. But it gets worse, as you'll see in some of the other examples, okay? So just to understand the implications of this. So the point is, once you know this thing has a bad condition number, you should think about whether you even want to solve the system of equations. You get what I'm saying? You might just say, it's hopeless, I give up, I'm never going to try. Because unless the B matrix is perfect, I'm going to get an erroneous answer. So this gives you some idea. So I took this into MATLAB, admittedly, because I didn't want to do this by hand. I found the solution of this, with <coughs> this problem with a big condition number, with this matrix. Again, the right-hand side, the B vector is 1. This is 1 plus epsilon for the second element. And then I'm telling you what the answer is, is a function of epsilon. So if epsilon is 0, there's no error, and the solution to this problem is 1 half and 1 half. Okay? If the solution, this is a small error, this is 1% error, if the solution is wildly wrong. Okay? One tenth of one percent error, totally wrong. One one hundredth of one percent, still way, quite wrong. Okay? So this is what I mean. Unless you can guarantee that you can measure, for example, perform these measurements with essentially no error, you can't have any confidence in the solution at all. Okay? So the way to think about this is this is an inherent problem. It has to do with the structure of the matrix A. There's no way around this problem. Okay? Um, so, unless you can somehow generate different equations, right, because the row of the matrix A is equations, so if you come up with a different set of equations, maybe, but if this is what you're stuck with, there's not much you can do, okay? All right, now, this is uh, a way of thinking about things I know you guys have not done, because, um, so, so if I say something, so, right, so far you've taken the following leap of faith with me. If you have a big condition number, it's bad. If a matrix, I've, I've implied the following. A big condition number is going to lead to unreliable solutions, right? And, and I gave you an example of one that had a big condition number and an unreliable solution. But that's not a general result. <laughs> it's just like one example, okay? This is a general result. And the reason I'm going to, I don't do a lot of this in the course. I used to do more and then I found the students had trouble understanding it. But I think if you're going to read and understand applied math, you have to be able to understand things like this. So I thought I would go through this slowly, just so you could get a flavor of how people, why you even worry about the condition number, okay? Why you can say it controls the air, okay? So you get, you get a result like this, okay? And this is standard applied mathematics. So, so what am I saying here? First of all, there's the equation, AX equal B plus delta b, okay? So this is meant to say I've got a system of equations that look like ax equal b, and then the b vector has a potential error called delta b. If delta b is zero, there's no error, okay? Otherwise there is error. I mean, right, for the problem I gave you, right? the delta B thing was zero and epsilon, okay? All right, and so what I'm interested in is how much will an error delta B make an error in the solution X, okay? So you understand that if I have a, if I have a, this system of equations AX equal B, I'm gonna get a solution called X. That's the true solution, okay? I have another problem which is the real problem 
and now on the right hand side is B plus delta B. Okay. Now I'm going to get another solution that looks like X plus delta X. In other words, this air in the solution comes from this air in the B vector. And I want to know how big this thing is going to get as a result of that thing. And I don't want to specify the matrix A. I want a, a general result. Okay? So that's what this um, inequality is trying to, to tell you. Okay? It's saying if you have, um, so I've defined everything now, right? X is, the tr ah. X is the true solution. B is the vector if there was no air. Delta X is the air that you get in the solution. Delta B is the air in the vector, okay? So I've explained this all in words here very slowly. But the idea here is I'm going to this, you can see the condition number tells you how much the air in B translates into an air in X. It's an inequality. <laughs> I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken the air in the data and I've scaled, so this is a norm, right? Because we don't know how to talk about um, what, um, let's say, delta B is. So we talk about, I mean, delta B is a vector. We want a scalar measure, we, see we take its norm. So we're measuring everything by its norm. The size of everything, because they're vectors, are measured by its norm. So I'm taking the norm of B the delta B, the air in B, and I'm scaling that by the air in B itself. Okay? So it's like the relative air. Obviously, if B is really huge, then an then a, then a air might look big, but it may not be big compared to B itself, right? And if you've got an air of 1 and, and the one element of B is 10 million, then that's almost no air at all. But if you have an air of 1 and the element of B is 2, that's a huge air. So you, that's why you scale by B. Whoops, sorry. Okay? And then I'm going to do the same thing on the left hand side. I'm going to take the air that is induced in the solution by this air and I'm going to scale it by X itself. Okay? So I'm going to scale each of these airs by the, by the values of the vectors themselves. And then you can see a proportionality between the air in B and the air in X is the condition number. That's, how I can t that's why I can tell you that a bad condition number takes errors in B and potentially makes big errors in X because of this inequality. Okay. Um, so when you see it, I think what happens is when, let's say you re you're reading the book, right? Uh, everything looks fine. Then you see this thing, you say. You're reading. You get to this point. I fear that most people go, oh boy, just skip over that. Because <laughs> you know? you, it's, it's like, it's not, it takes a little time to learn how to think this way. <laughs> but I think as an engineer, I mean, this isn't a, a proof of, you know, some... Gauss's conjecture or something like this. It's 50 page proof that gives you the Nobel Prize, okay? It's just an inequality trying to explain to you why the condition number is used to represent ill conditioning and how it relates to an air in B becoming an air in X, okay? So understanding it, you don't need to understand its derivation, you just need to understand what it means, okay? Last thing I want to me mention is um, you notice this is an inequality here, okay? That means the actual air you get is bounded by this. You understand? Like the air can never be bigger than you calculate over here, but it could be a lot smaller. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you that right now. Okay, so we're going to apply this idea here. So I've gotten bitter about leaving early. I've added more gratuitous slides for it, just, just so you can't leave. So don't plan on getting out of here early. <laughs> I'm kidding, they have a point. All right, here's your problem. Okay, this is, this is a simple example. This is actually not a very ill-conditioned problem, but it's just meant to illustrate the concept here. Okay, so here's our system of equations. So three by three problem, there's the A matrix, there's the B, and I'm telling you that's the answer. Okay, that's the true answer. Okay, so for delta B equals zero, I just told you what X was, okay? Now I'm going to form this problem. It looks just the same, except I now have a B plus a delta B. Okay, that's a pretty small air, right? Because the, these things are order 10 or greater, and this is just order 0.1. Okay? All right, now I'm going to tell you that if you t form this B vector with these two things added together, which is a slightly perturbed version of that, you get a, a solution that looks like that. It, it looks a lot like the original solution. Right? It's a little perturbed, if you know, a little different. It's ind indicative of this A matrix is not a bad matrix, but I'm just trying to illustrate this theorem I just gave you. Okay? So, 
in this case, I can actually calculate the true error, right? The true error in the solution is this solution minus that solution. This is the solution I get that has the error, and this is the true solution with no error. Delta X is the difference between the two. How much the solution changed as a result of this introduction of delta B? It's that thing there, right? If I take that vector and subtract off that one, I get that. It's that simple. Okay. All right. Now, let's say that, again, how do we characterize an error like this? What we do is we take the norm of it because it's a vector and we don't like to think about vectors. We like to think about the norm of vectors in terms of quantifying the size of a vector. So what I've done down here is I've just taken the norm of this, the one norm, right? The no one norm means you add up all the absolute values of these things and that gives you that number there. Just add up those three elements. They're all positive, so. But in general, you take the absolute value. So that's, that's a true measure of the error, okay? That's the true error, the norm of the true error. All right, so th this is the result we had before. It's slightly manipulated. What I want to do now is I want to calculate this bound here. And I'm going to do this by, because I want to know what the delta x is from this relationship. So I'm going to multiply the norm of x onto the other side and I'm going to calculate this left hand side. And that'll give me an estimate of what the error is. And this time, for this problem, I know what the actual error is. I'll compare the two. Okay, that's the idea. So that's what I've done here. I'm using the one norm. So that's the equation that I told you I multiplied across by the norm of x. And now I'm applying the one norm for everything. So we actually calculated on a previous slide. That's where I got this matrix A from, the condition number of this matrix. It was 3.75. Okay. Um, now I need the one norm of what the error in the B vector is. So that's this vector here. To calculate the one norm, you just add up all these elements. That gives you 0.3. Okay. Now I need to know the one norm of the vector B itself. Add up all those elements, it gives you 42. And now I need to know what the one norm of the true solution is. That's this thing. Have to take the absolute value, obviously, and add them up. And I think that's 16. Okay. So that means the error in the solution, according to this result, can be no greater than that. And that's true, because that number is definitely less than that number. The problem is it's a lot less. <laughs> you see? So. This is just, uh, well, t two points. One is how to use this type of result and try to get a better understanding of it. It also points to what we call the conservativeness of it, right? So it's an upper bound. You know, it's, in this case, it's not what we call a tight upper bound. That's the actual error. That's what we think the error can be no greater than. It's true, the error is less than that, but it's a lot less. So this is the problem with these type of relationships like this, is this gives you the worst case scenario. The real case might be a lot better than that, but it'll be no worse. That's just the way it works, okay? All right, now let's go to, um, actually, you might get out of here early. <laughs> I might just stall. Um, all right, so I got, this is not on the slides I gave you because I got bored this morning and decided I'd do this. I'm not sure what got into me, but uh, in the past, I've told you, oh, we played around with this Hilbert matrix. Um, you remember you built a little function that calculated the Hilbert matrix, or at least you were supposed to. So this is the Hilbert matrix. So it's an n by n matrix that has this structure here, okay? So that's the three by three case. You, were, you came in one day and you tried to write a little function in MATLAB with uh, some for loops that basically implemented the calculation of a Hilbert matrix of any size, okay? I have such a function because I wrote it. And so what I did here was I took, I constructed the Hilbert matrix. Again, it's an n by n matrix where n is that number there. And then I calculated the condition number in MATLAB, I have to admit, for matrices of different size. And I've told you when the first time that I ever introduced this Hilbert matrix, I probably said some things about Hilbert like he was really smart. And then I said, Hilbert matrix is a ca classic case of a matrix being ill-conditioned. People, reason people are interested in the Hilbert matrix because it's a kind of prototypical example of an ill-conditioned matrix. And you can see that here, okay? So if you form the two by two Hilbert matrix, right? That's just that, that thing right there, that two by two, it has a uh, condition number of 19. That's, that's fine, no problem, okay? Form the four by four Hilbert matrix, uh-oh, 16,000. So it gets like ill-conditioned quick with size, okay? Um, and if you get up to seven or eight, you know, you're getting million, a billion for the condition number. 
Okay. So it would be hopeless to think about calculating. Um, I mean, of course, it's very unlikely you're going to get a system of equations look like Hilbert matrix X equals B. <laughs> okay. But this is just a good example of um, that a seemingly innocuous matrix like this, you know, three-dimensional Hilbert matrix can have a huge condition number. I forget what the three-dimensional one is, but it's, um, it's large also. Okay. So, no matter how hard I try, um, it's all right. So the, the final example here is meant to illustrate the fact that if you have a matrix that's large, okay, it's very likely that the matrix will be ill-conditioned just as a function of being large. Okay. You have to understand, if you have a three by three matrix and you want to know if it's, it's ill-conditioned, then you, write, you have to be able to multiply two of the rows and almost get the third row. That's not that likely. But if you have a hundred equations, then all you have to do is find you're right, you can multiply six of the equations and almost get one of them. I mean, there's a lot more possibilities that you could find that you could almost um, have a redundant row, okay, as the matrix grows. So this is an example I put together, was easy to do in MATLAB, just to illustrate that inherently big matrices are ill-conditioned, okay. So I, uh, given that we've done statistics, I think you, you um, at least know some of this. So. I admit I did this in MATLAB. I don't usually do MATLAB stuff in the lectures, but I'm not going to do this by hand. All right. Um, so you might recall this function, um, RAND. So this is something that um, is a function in MATLAB. It comes from, I guess it's in the statistics toolbox, but it basically generates, I guess we maybe didn't do that because this is actually not drawn from a, it's, it's not drawn from a particular distribution. It gener generates random numbers between zero and one. They're all equally probable. Okay. So like if you did a Gaussian, right, if you sample from a Gaussian distribution, you're more, you have to specify the mean and the variance and you're more likely to get a number near the mean. But for this one, it's just <coughs> random. It's equally likely it'll be any number between zero and one. Okay. And then there is a function which I'll teach you tomorrow called the condition. This is a MATLAB function, condition number of A. So if you give MATLAB a square matrix, A, it'll compute the condition number of it. So I just concatenated these two commands. So the, right, you can do this in MATLAB. So I'm going to first of all generate an N by N matrix, right? Because that's what it does. It's going to be a bunch of random numbers. And then I'm going to compute the condition number of that matrix. So for example, I'm going to first of all start by putting a two in there. Okay, I'm going to compute a two by two matrix with random elements, right? They're just random numbers. Then I'm compute the condition number of that, right? And then I'm going to keep computing the condition number as n increases. And then I'm going to show, well, okay. I got, it got a little more complicated than that, but okay. So that's how I started, right? I put it, I put a two in here, calculate a two by two random matrix, calculate the condition number of that. Okay. The problem with random numbers is they're random. And one sample ain't enough. That's not great English, but anyway. Um, so if you want to do something and you want a legitimate result, you have to do a lot of results. So I did each of these a, a thousand, a hundred times. I'm not sure <laughs> what my problem was that day. Uh, I got to get more hobbies, I guess. Okay. Um, so, right, I did each of this a hundred times and took the average because you can get a spurious result from doing just one, right? You can just get a, a luck. You might get a two by two matrix that's almost singular just by chance. So I did it a hundred times. And the idea here is I did this for n equal one, which will always have a condition number of one, two, five, way up. And then the idea did each of these a hundred times average the condition number for all hundred of these. And I'm going to try to show you the condition number um, gets large quickly. Okay. All right. So this is the, just the plot of the results. I thought it was better than showing a table. So this is right. This is the average condition number. So I did a hundred of them and averaged it. And then I forget what numbers I did down here. I did one, two, sorry. So I did these. That's 200 by the way. So I did all these numbers between zero and a hundred. I also did 200, 500, and a thousand. Okay. And you can see as long as the N is pretty small, so this, you can see the scale here is quite large. It's 10 to the fifth, okay? But even when you're down here, I don't know, so that's about 0.1, it's about 10. So if it's 100, it was about 10 to the fourth. So I told you 1,000 is about when you start to worry, which is 10 to the third. So already when it's 100, it's getting pretty, pretty ill-conditioned. And you understand this isn't ill-conditioned 
because the equations have any particular structure, because everything's random. It's just ill-conditioned because it's big. Okay? And then you can see as the matrix gets larger and larger, um, the condition number starts to get very large. Okay, 10 to the fifth. So in this class, obviously, we're not going to be working with problems that are, you know, 500 equations and 500 unknowns, but the kind of research we do in my lab, we routinely use equations that are 1,000 equations, 1,000 unknowns, okay? So those problems being ill-conditioned are kind of very, very likely, okay? This is a little bit misleading because, you know, real problems actually have structure. <laughs> they have, sorry, they actually have some structure. So this is maybe a little little worse than the actual scenario because the actual scenario equations aren't random but this just gives you the idea the general trend is problems get big they get ill-conditioned okay all right that's it i'll see you tomorrow